My name's Ghislaine Boddington and I'm a reader in digital immersion at the University of Greenwich and the lead curator for this webinar series. This is a four talk series linked to Datum R&D, an Innovate UK funded project which has been run through University of Greenwich, ZUK and Body Data Space. The project is looking at two outputs. One part is called Datum Audio and one part Datum AR. But we're not going to really talk about those today. What we're doing is actually bringing to you a series of discussions which are coming up within the project, particularly around the ethics and sustainability of data and data harvesting. I've got a few little instructions to share with you, instructions, little rules, processes, as I need to really emphasize to all of you attending today, this is a webinar and therefore the speakers and the chairs and the panelists will be the only voices and faces seen during this next hour and a half. However, we have decided to try and make this webinar format as interactive as possible. And the two chat rooms, both in the YouTube and in the um, Zoom today, will become documents resources which will be attached to the recording to go to the university onto the university YouTube website in a week or so. So as you do here, the attended, the speakers and the chairs, you will see their biogs going up in the chat box and you'll be able to see links of their work. Also, we do encourage you all to add in your own links at the relevant points to the chat using the chat book box drop down panelists and attendee and attendees do make sure you use panelists and attendees if you use only panelists your stuff will not be seen by everybody else who is attending today so the attendees please do add in any links that you think would be relevant to this chat anything maybe about your own work your own projects maybe links to reports to articles you've seen relating to the topic of today's webinar and those will be added into the resource document to be shared amongst us all so we are today weaving experience here between expert speakers and this is an enterprise linked event and it is for the public and for the staff and students of Greenwich with knowledge resource outputs which will be used onwards for lecturers here and around the country and internationally. We do have a tweet stream going. The tweet is hash nudge push 21 and I'm sure that will go in the chat box for you to gather very soon. And we are using also the question and answers box in Zoom today, which is the second way that you can interact with us. So do drop any questions into the question and answers box. Do actually upvote anything in there that you feel you would like to definitely be approached. And do bear with us because we will group questions. We won't necessarily answer everybody's by name just to make sure that we actually get the right questions into the panelists at the end and get some thinking going forward. Also, just to say to you, in this technology led discussion, looking at how data is, a, is being taken and led from us and our bodies and being used in positive and negative ways to enable social change, to uh, look at accountability, to look at the ethics of this. We're not looking for solutions. If anything, we're looking for the next questions that we all must ask ourselves, ask each other, research onwards and approach for the future. So do look to the future and do look to some future outcomes and options and do share those with us too. And we're saying this to the attendees too, the positives and the negatives as well. Now tonight, today, this afternoon, sorry, at 4.30 this afternoon in BST time, we actually have an all women's panel, which does a little to make up for the lack of women's voices heard in the past. And we have some wonderful women from different backgrounds leading this panel, from different age groups, from different experiences. And I'm going to hand you over now to the chairs for this session. Olga Martin, Martin Ortega, who is a professor in international law at the University of Greenwich. And Eva Pasco, who is a director of e-commerce at the retail practice and chair of Cyber Salon. So Olga and Eva, can I ask you to join? Great, wonderful. 
So I'm going to hand over to you for, for your for, for your three speakers in the discussion. And I'll be listening in and I'll look very, look very much looking forward to it. And I'll join you again at the end of the webinar. That's great. Thank you very much, Elaine. This is interesting adventure to have two co-chairs. We just have to mime to each other. <laughs> but uh, sh shall I start and just introduce very quickly uh, yes, what, what I will be talking about and then I will hand over to Olga so he, she will introduce her speakers. Uh, so I'm Eva Pasco. I'm a co-founder of uh, Siberia Cafe. Uh, if I can have the slides uh, Reza, we can start showing a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so I've I've started the internet back, the introduction of the internet to uh, High Street and to people back in mid 90s. And it really was a little bit of a portal to another universe. We didn't know how different that digital universe will be. But I think now we're finding out 20 years later, that it's very different indeed. And uh, my very good friend, Sadie Frost, back in, uh, in the day, she was uh, calling internet this portal to the metaverse. And we were always complaining that, no, no, it's just an extension of the analog world. And I think we're all learning that it isn't. It's a very different, a very disruptive world uh, that uh, probably will take us to places that we haven't really dreamt on in a good or bad way. So, it, so cyber cafes were physical examples on the high street of a shop uh, where you can get coffee and computers. So you could wander in from your analog world and get lost in your digital world. Uh, so if you go to the slide two, uh, so Siberia was very, very simple place. Uh, it was just a bunch of computers, coffee, but it had that magic of entering into what we now know the virtual space. Um, and many people learned the internet first time there. So in some strange way, the portal to digital was very much for physical. Uh, and I had this idea of taking it very further. So if you show the slide free, Reza, uh, we started uh, designing virtual fashion. So we'll talk a little bit later about that in detail, but I think that's where it really started. So. I've been very fortunate to be invited for my cameo role in a virtual game back in the 90s. And I designed my own virtual fashion, which uh, hopefully still is you know, surfing somewhere in the cyberspace. Uh, and if you can show the, the little video from that, you can show how people started thinking about expressing themselves in virtual world. There should be a little video. Okay, that's fine. This is probably as far as it go. But I just wanted to show you what the virtual world and virtual fashion ideas were like back in the mid 90s. So, so this was sort of probably proto virtual experience where we were all dreaming about meeting in virtual nightclubs. The technology wasn't quite there yet, but, uh, but we did our best. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, it was all very arty. It was certainly not about data. We had a lot of fun with uh, digital to physical, and we were looking at designing our clothes from uh, prints, from digital prints and back into fabrics. So it was kind of really going around both ways. Uh, but it definitely wasn't about data. And Louis Montoli, who invented third party cookies, wasn't really uh, around till about uh, late 90s. And I hope that uh, uh, he, is, he is feeling guilty for what he's done because he invented third party cookies, which absolutely changed internet and not for the better. So from this archy kind of slightly bohemian, very equal and very diverse world, like we were absolutely mixed a lot more than any, anything after. 
Uh, I think by the time Google has come up, the, the concept of uh, data and tech bros has come, but in, in the beginning it was all very diverse. So we move to the next step. I think we, the next slide, please. I think we realized about 2005 that technology might be neutral at the time had this big piece about technology is neutral, but there were companies that were turning it into a really bad and evil things like Google uh, with the entrance into search engines. So there was this big shift from very artistic, bohemian, cooperative and open source uh, back to uh, patriarchy and back to tech bros and back to the abuse of data. And a lot of that abuse of data was also abuse of fashion data. So if you move, move to the next step, we were concerned with that. And on the next slide, you can see we co-founded Cyber Salon, which was an organization to fight for digital rights. Uh, we co-opted all sorts of wonderful people to that, managed to get to House of Commons. Uh, we work with Birgitta Yondesdotti, who was the Pirate Party MP. Uh, we nearly founded Pirate Party in UK, uh, and that probably would have been a good idea to, to protect the digital rights. Uh, but um, after quite successful campaign, we started getting pushback from the big companies who are lobbying hard to keep the data grab as open as possible. So if we just move to the next slide, uh, after the House of Commons, we did uh, a number of big events with Tim Berners-Lee on conferences called Web We Want, with mass consultation about how people perceive the loss of data and how threatened and how upset and anxious they are about loss of data. And after that campaign, we managed to get it to Labour Party Manifesto for 2019. Uh, alas, as we know, that wasn't a particularly successful adventure, but I've got a promise from uh, John McDonald that he will get me back in House of Commons after they come back and get Labour Party on the go again in the autumn. So, you know, there's a combination of data fights in the political space, but also in the fashion space, because in my day job, I used to run Topshop, I created Topshop online, and I was very aware how fashion and body data were encroaching on the individual territory. Uh, so the one of the speakers today will be covering it up, but I think this, this area is particularly important for women because it's our data and our bodies that are really at play in an increasingly commercial marketplace. So I think that's all from me, and I would like to hand over to Olga so she can introduce her angle on the data and the internet. So over to Olga. Uh, thank you very much, um, Eva. So as um, Ghislaine has said, I am uh, a professor of international law and I'm a professor of international human rights and my speciality is business and human rights and the environment. This is the way we can make uh, corporations, especially big corporations, accountable for the impact they have on uh, on our lives and the lives of those who make their products and our environment. Uh, so I bring a, a different perspective in uh, to some extent. Where I I am concerned about this uh, um, aspect of sustainability of the um, digital fashion as we're going to discuss it today. So um, I thought I'll introduce a little bit of this perspective um, and the work that um, we're doing as well. So the social and environmental impact of unrestrained consumerism is clear. We have been voicing the dramatic effects of an economic system based on endless growth and accumulation of things for a long time. The fashion industry is based, and as I understand it, uh, but you're all much more uh, in tuned and much more fashionable than I am for sure, is based on the premise of empowerment to define our own identity. But our identity has become somewhat equated to our capacity, desire and uncontrolled urge to consume and accumulate. While we do, uh, we don't see, so while, while we're doing this, we don't see what's behind the garment, behind the shoe, the lipstick, the smartphone. And what we don't see is that they're humans, they're families, they're and our environment. So uh, the attempts to modify behavior patterns for ethical consumption is not new, of course. What is new is this widespread sense of identity linked to ethical choices, a, my, a mainstream of sustainable approach. Now from 
from a regulatory perspective, and I am, after all, as I said, a lawyer, the focus is very much on regulating the, condu the conduct of companies towards their supply chain. So in the UK, we've been pioneers in imposing obligations to companies to report on what are their efforts to combat modern slavery in their supply chain. And while these obligations are very deficient and, and demands from consumers, uh, the, it, well, sorry, while their obligations are very deficient, it's true that they have grown this demand from consumers. It's not just um, civil society organizations now, specialized NGOs that are demanding socially responsible produce goods um, is also uh, uh, most of us in our individual choices so uh, in particular in the in the UK the fashion industry and UK retailers are uh, some of the um, among the most compliance reporters under the UK modern slavery act we have a European Union level we have important initiatives that establish a mandatory to establish a mandatory human rights and environmental um, due diligence for companies operating in Europe and uh, this means that these companies will very soon be obliged to to undertake action to prevent, identify, mitigate, and remediate their negative impact. But we're seeing these kind of developments not just here in the um, global north, but uh, also in the producer countries. Uh, so, for example, um, very recently, uh, and six years after the Rana Plaza building collapse, that, as you remember, in 2013 killed over 1,100 garment workers in Bangladesh. The Bangladesh Supreme Court has actually um, uh, brought a case again, allowed a case against factory owners that for permitting that the uh, safety monitors um, and the, the safety conditions allowed for this collapse. So. Uh, Companies are even going farther in demanding um, this kind of ethical uh, constraints and ethical um, and sustainable regulation. And they're even demanding for this as a way to differentiate themselves. This is what I said at the beginning, you know, how uh, uh, we are supposedly making um, um, uh, sustainability mainstream. And I say supposedly because there's a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, just superficial um, compliance with some of these norms. And only um, a, a week and a half ago, ASOS, the big uh, online retailer, actually wrote a, um, an op-ed to the Times calling for um, regulation, more stronger regulation, mandatory human rights indulgence regulation in the UK. So the option is slow consuming, slow fashion consuming, uh, less and consumer more consciously. Uh, and this is where uh, digital fashion comes as well. You know, it's portrayed as a response, at least one of the tools that uh, we have to express ourselves and still be kind to the planet and those who make our clothes. But as a lawyer, I ask myself, um, what happens uh, now uh, that we don't accumulate things? Now we accumulate data, uh, data, you no know, space in the cloud. Uh, 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 what what are we um, uh, uh, the next step? What are we supplanting here? What are the physical, but also social, legal, emotional consequences of this new um, uh, data harvesting, as uh, Ghislaine has uh, pointed out? What role does uh, fashion play on this? So from a legal perspective, I'm very concerned with who the data belongs to, how digital fashion and fashion in digital form can facilitate human rights and environmental protection, or on the contrary, Tree. How can they further contribute to the violation of human rights, both of consumers and those impacted by corporate actions in the production um, supply chain and the environment? But I'm also concerned with a just transition. The fashion industry employs millions of people who depend on our consumer choices and our consumption at a speed, at a quality, uh, at a quantity. So how do we make sure that the drive towards sustainability does not result in, um, uh, in worsening uh, uh, working and living conditions for others? So I'm sure we'll explore many of these issues. And with this um, uh, short introduction, I would like to bring in um, 
um, our first speaker, um, which is um, uh, Ingrid, um, Ingrid Karikari. Um, we're going to uh, now please have um, the Ingrid's um, bio on the chat. Uh, and Ingrid, it's an absolute pressure, uh, uh, pleasure to have you here. And uh, you have the floor. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Olga. Thanks, Ava and Ghislaine. It's brilliant to be here. Um, a real pleasure. Um, do you think we could start my show? Fantastic. So yeah, my name is Ingrid Carry Carry. Um, I'm a digital consultant and strategist. I've been working in tech for about 20 years and uh, have worked in all sort of manner of um, sectors and industries. Um, I've really enjoyed working with Ava on some projects in the past. So yeah, so basically online shopping, you know, love it or hate it, it's here to stay. It's a double-edged sword for most of us, really. There's the um, convenience, you know, you can sit at home, you can do it when you want. Um, you have what looks like infinite choice when you get onto these websites and you might even get a better deal. But, you know, also there's the downside. It's not much fun. It's no, there's no buzz, um, you know, like when you enter a shop, you know, seeing who's there, what's going on. You can't try anything on, you know, you can't see it on your body or feel the fabric or anything like that. And you may not even be in when the package finally returns. You know, it could be that awful trip to the post office depot or sort of trawling around neighbours to find, try and find a package that's gone missing. And you may even have to return whatever it is you bought because, you know, it didn't work or it didn't fit. But of course, um, online shopping is here to stay, especially given the last year when an extra one and a half million people in the UK went online for the first time. Next one, please. So yes, yeah, so online shopping has created huge opportunities and challenges for online brands. In the last year, 72% of online consumers have bought goods from an on on online retailer. Um, so there's clearly a lot of money to be made. Online brands want to provide cust a customer experience that minimizes the hassles and downsides and comes as close as possible to the best in-person shopping experience, but online. So they're looking at ways to make online shopping as frictionless as possible. When you buy clothes, you want them to fit. And this is a particular challenge for these online fashion brands that they're seeking to overcome. A staggering 42% of all clothes bought online are returned. And the issue of sizing is the main reason for those returns. For ethical brands in particular, it's a real problem as that last mile of getting the products from, you know, the, um, the companies to customers can have a real impact on their carbon footprints and their profitability. So what you're seeing right now is um, just a screenshot from um, one of what I call fit companies. There are fit companies like Size Bay and TrueFit out there that are looking to solve this problem of sizing for online brands. So essentially, they are third party platforms that integrate into e-commerce sites and allow customers to enter their measurements and preferences. And then this data is matched with data on garment sizes and styles which the brands supply. So with all this data in the bag, customers are then recommended specific sizes and styles of clothes or shoes which enables them to buy with the confidence that the items will fit and that they won't have to be returned. So it's quite a big shakeup. Next slide, please. I mean, you can see the convenience of something like that if you're having to shop online and maybe it's a new brand or, you know, you just wanna know that it's not gonna be a wasted, um, you know, half an hour or whatever online getting stuff sent to you. But the fit companies are really pushing the benefits of um, these platforms, you know, that it reduces returns and that they can give customers the confidence to buy more online and drive both revenue and profits. Next slide, please. I feel very Chris Whitty. So, yeah, so this is the fashion genome and this is um, a product that is um, on offer from TrueFit, which is one of those um, fit companies. So basically what they've done is amassed huge amounts of data, of sizing data, both from brands and also from consumers. So I don't know whether you can see the numbers on there, but 16,000 brands have had their data mapped. 
there are 200 million registered users. There's 550 million anonymized customer profiles. And I'm one of those now, having uh, gone on there just to see exactly how much it all works. And then they're also, you know, sizing up garments in 25 different ways to enable the fit to work much better. So the questions that sort of came to my mind when I saw all of these um, mind blowing figures is, you know, where is this body data? Is it safe? You know, it's in the cloud, but can people hack it? Can they get their hands on it? Who owns it? And what are these companies going to do with it? And what could be done with it if it's spliced with data sources from with um, data sources and offered to um, fourth parties? What could become of all this data? Where could it all end? Next slide, please. Next slide. Fantastic. Oh, yep, yeah, that's it. Brilliant. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so where will it all end? Um, you know, are we entering a world of sort of carefree, precision, ethical shopping, where we're able to buy frictionlessly online because brands know our bodies, they know what we like, they know how they like our clothes to fit so that they can increase our sort of individuality and we can express our creativity and that waste and um, energy use can be reduced. You know, is this the future that we're looking at? Or are we heading to a place of unintended consequences where once body data is captured, ubiquitous and available, it's put to use in ways which can influence and control not just what we wear, but ultimately who we are. So imagine a world for a minute where the combination of body data, big data and body shaming coalesce so that older, larger ladies are only presented with loose, billowing, modest looking clothes, while younger, slimmer women who fit some sort of ideal are offered only the opposite. And it's all packaged up by an algorithm that presents these options as personal choice. When most of us encountered Facebook, it was simply a way to connect with friends and family. And now it can turn and influence elections all around the world. So my question is, could the simple desire for a better online shopping experience lead to much more than that? Could it make us all handmaids or Marthas for those of you who were sort of Margaret Atwood fans? I think I may have let my imagination run away with me, but I think it's well worth pausing on the promise and perils of data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. That that was uh, fascinating um, and definitely uh, brings a lot of food for thought and uh, a lot of the um, interesting points uh, from a human rights perspective are, are definitely going to come out as well in the discussion, I'm, I'm sure. Um, now we're, I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, Argiro uh, Karanasiu, who is uh, a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich, and uh, she's my uh, very good colleague that sits, uh, used to sit right in front of me uh, and we haven't seen each other for a whole year even though we we work uh, uh, just uh, side by side so uh, her um, bio is as well in the chat Argiro it's a pleasure to give you the floor thank you very much Olga uh, you will allow me for a few seconds there so that I share my slides And you can all see the slides, yeah? Take that as a yes. So yes, um, yes, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for the, uh, the kind invite. Now, um, I would like briefly to tell you a story. These uh, series of talks are entitled A Nudge and a Push. And I'll be telling you all the story about data nudges today. Um, this is a story with uh, three parts. I will first provide a rough sketch of the data consumer. I will then turn to uh, address consumer agency in data-driven ecosystems. And I will finish with a few observations on data nudges that will hopefully provide some stimuli for the discussion later on. So 
we consume data on a daily basis. And let's stop numbers here. Uh, right now, for this meeting, uh, we are consuming approximately 50 megabytes per minute. By the end of this day, uh, 300 billion emails will be sent and 500 million tweets will be generated. Well, a bit less now that Donald Trump is off Twitter. But we also consume content. Uh, we, we spend actually a lot of time in front of screens consuming content, social media, videos, ads, news, webinars like this one, and much, much more. We are practically living half of our lives in digital environments. And this informs our choices, but it also provides guidance for next steps. As consumers, we're also being studied online and offline. We ourselves are also data being consumed um, by commercial entities to provide us with something very, very valuable um, advice to take the right decision. Now, you must understand one thing. Humans uh, find it very difficult to take decisions. We absolutely hate having to decide. Um, and yet we are called to take approximately 3,500 decisions on a daily basis. And some of these decisions, uh, like fashion, for example, they carry significant moral values um, and enter data. Uh, our digital footprints are valuable information that can determine uh, future purchasing habits. Um, take, for example, Netflix. Netflix quietly taking notes of all the things that you've watched uh, so that they can then um, um, make some informed suggestions for the next movie for you to watch. Um, so we generate data um, that are valuable and uh, we generate data that can be a meaningful tool, not just in terms of taking a good decision tailored to our own personal taste, uh, but also to take the right decision, the morally right decision that promotes sustainability. So in short, technology is there, uh, the potential is strong, and what I'm about to tell you next is how it all went wrong. So consumers nowadays uh, are being treated as passive data generators of behavioral patterns used to attract or to retain consumption. Um, take, for example, the uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal. Uh, that was hardly a wake-up call, um, but it documented well this growing economic system that is centered around the uh, commodification of personal data with a core purpose of profit-making. Um, we generate raw data that essentially feeds uh, this economy. So, so far, we've seen um, how data actually holds uh, some really good potential for uh, influencing consumption. And that being said, the, uh, the consumer is often regarded as a passive part to this uh, equation. So data is used as a means of personalizing consumption, but uh, with no actual moral or ethical considerations. Um, so, in fast fashion, for example, um, the idea is a rather simple one. Uh, buy, wear, repeat. Um, could data be used beyond marketing to, to actually help uh, us make more sustainable choices and to promote ethical consumption? And how do we break this uh, vicious circle um, of buy, wear, repeat? Uh, can we change this long established behavioral pattern so speaking of uh, changing behaviors, that's something that is currently at the heart of policy making. And of course, there are different approaches to uh, behavioral changes from enforcing regulation to uh, educating people by providing information. You can ban cigarettes, for example, and at the same time, you can educate people um, about the dangers of smoking. But can you influence their smoking habits though? Behavioral economics um, have long grappled with the idea of using nudges, namely positive and gentle um, persuasion tactics to encourage certain behaviors. Nudging is based on an understanding of the psychology of decision making. Uh, why do we decide to buy a two pound t-shirt at Primark when we know perfectly well that this is not ethically produced? 
Um, in fact, our brains have limited resources to make sense of this uh, complex world we live in. And we often are very, very lazy. Um, we use mental shortcuts um, or defaults to take the, the easiest option. Uh, so a nudge in this sense is providing someone with a guidance, a choice, so as to trigger um, a, a particular behavioral uh, response. One such example is uh, placing fruit at eye level so that people start eating healthy and so that um, obesity uh, rates are lowered. Um, another example is to uh, put cigarettes behind the cashier so that it's more difficult to reach and thus to purchase. Um, so data-driven methods are already widely used in marketing to influence consumers. And in this sense, data nudges could actually be a valuable tool towards empowering the consumer, turning a passive consumer into an ethical consumer able to influence um, the, the supply chain to a certain extent. So data nudges can in fact offer a personalized um, experience. At the same time, they could offer ethical purchasing experiences. It would not stop consumption, but it would perhaps add sustainability to the mix. Um, in a sense, data nudges would allow us to utilize data for promoting public interest goals for once. Instead of passively consuming data, we can actually, in fact, learn and act upon data. The time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Argyra. That was that was fascinating. I kind of know a lot of it, but when you see it pulled together, uh, it really, really wakes you up. I mean, fashion is changing and it's morphing into something very different, but it's still got quite a lot of luggage. Um, but there is a person who might point us in the direction of better future of retail and better future for fashion. So we're very uh, happy to have uh, Michaela from The Fabricant. If I can just uh, quickly introduce her, Michaela has been really on the forefront of virtual fashion. Uh, so when we had our little adventures about virtual designs for virtual nightclubs back in 90s, the technology wasn't really there to make it anything more just than a little play. But luckily the tech has moved and uh, Michaela's company has jumped right into it. So um, Michaela, can I ask you to introduce yourself and to talk about your concept of the future of fashion? Certainly, thank you for the introduction. And it was so wonderful to see your, um, your presentation because it's very much the genesis of everything that we do. Um, so my name is Michaela. I'm the head of content and strategy for The Fabricant, which essentially means that I define our brand voice and philosophy, and then it's my job to communicate that to the world. So uh, let me see if I can make a good job of that whilst uh, presenting via the wonderful world of Zoom. And hopefully you can see my screen. If I just put it into present mode. Okay, so here we are. So who is the fabricant? Um, the Fabricant is the world's first digital fashion house. I'm now thinking that might be an overclaim in view of uh, Eva's presentation, but I'm gonna stick with it for now. And we create digital only 3D garments and fashion narratives. Everything that we create um, is always digital and never physical. We describe ourselves as fashion notes, not fashionistas. Um, we operate in this new fashion paradigm. So we tend to try and think of new language to describe what we do. Uh, and by fashion notes, we mean that we're creative pioneers exploring the 3D digital space where fashion meets technology. Um, everything we do tries to bring emotional storytelling into the digital space. Um, fashion can still be emotional, even though it's non-physical. And that's what we try to bring into all of our iterations. Um, the visual that you're looking at on the right-hand side is from one of our, um, it's actually our original digital couture collection called Deep. And that was designed in collaboration with an algorithm which was fed data sets that told it what fashion was. And then it devised um, designs to try and get a, a handle on what fashion could be in the digital space. And that was a collaboration with our creative director. So we have to reimagine the future of fashion when we think of it as non-physical. 
Um, everything we do, we try to lead the current fashion industry towards a new sector of digital only clothing and, and really show the value of what fashion can be when it's not physical. Um, when something's non-physical, obviously we're not never creating a physical product. So it's inherently more sustainable. We're not taking raw materials out of the ground. Um, we're not using up precious resources in the same way that the current physical fashion industry does. Um, and inevitably it has to be more innovative because we're creating a new way of looking at fashion and everything in the digital environment, of course, has no physical boundaries. So the creative palette opens up. Um, suddenly there's no gravity. Suddenly you can be wearing a, a dress made of thunderstorms or a suit made of living vines. So it really kind of opens up these sort of wilder creative options, which I guess in the fashion sense have never been thought of before. Um, and from a consumer perspective, they quite rightly ask like, what, what do you mean that fashion can be non-physical? So we ask them to imagine what fashion can be when it transcends the physical body. When we stop thinking of fashion as something that protects us or, or covers us and instead becomes some, a place where we can explore our identity or express maybe parts of ourselves that we don't express in the physical world. Um, and everything that we do as a digital fashion house is kind of imagining a post-waste future. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the circular economy conversation, which is incredibly important, which is using waste as, as a resource and keeping all our precious materials in circulation. Obviously in a digital fashion environment, we, we don't create waste whatsoever. So it's sort of this evolution of the circular economy conversation, um, which is very interesting, I think. Um, this statement, we waste nothing but data and exploit nothing but our imagination, is how we describe our work in a sustainability concept, uh, uh, in a sustainability concept. I, I realize in the context of this um, conversation, wasting data could seem a little bit outraged. That doesn't mean we're splurging, splurging people's private data everywhere. Um, this sentence kind of exists in, um, in opposition to the current fashion status quo, which is obviously very wasteful and incredibly exploitative in, in so many ways, as has been covered by everybody else's presentations. So, uh, but it is something that we believe in that fashion can be something that's new, non-exploitative, and very much a sustainable practice. Obviously, when we talk about this world, it does require a, a mind, mindset shift from how we imagine fashion. So, when we talk about digital fashion directly to consumers, um, there are obviously a lot of questions, but just presenting something as a digital only item, ask them to reconsider the way that they consume fashion. Do we need to create physical stuff? When we're just interacting via a screen as we are now, we don't need to create something physical. We can be digitally dressed. Um, obviously digitally dressing gives you a new avenue for self-expression where maybe, as I mentioned before, you can find other ways of, you know, expressing multiple selves. We're all sort of different people on different days and different moods. So within a digital fashion environment, you can maybe have several alternative personas that you like to express in, in certain environments. Um, obviously, when there's nothing physical, you don't have to deliver clothes. You don't have to store clothing in, in closets and wardrobes. Um, garments don't have to be shipped across the planet. So it asks us to redefine what the ownership of clothing means when it doesn't physically exist. And everything we do as a digital fashion company and trying to create this entire industry really of digital fashion is to encourage physical fashion brands to realize that digital clothing can be an instinctive part of their offering. And, and in doing so, it can reduce the need to produce physical items. Um, and it's really something that can be talked of within the current fashion paradigm. The image that you're looking at on the right is um, a project that we did with Buffalo London where we um, created a digital only sneaker for them. And they put that on their website and offered it as an item where you could be digitally dressed. Obviously this is a very new and slightly confronting idea for people, but it was a really great moment where a physical fashion brand was willing to have this conversation. So it was a real landmark. I'm going to move on to our video and see if we can play this. Um, Zoom isn't so particularly friendly, but oh, here we are, it's good. Um, so all the ideas I've talked about are encapsulated on this video where we're discussing a platform that we're going to create. Hopefully it's in iteration right now. So um, 
This is sort of the conceptual idea of where our Leela platform, which will be a digital fashion platform, it hopes to go. So I'll just leave you with this for a moment. Uh, so that was Leela, the platform that we're creating, uh, but ultimately everything we do at The Fabricant poses this question. Uh, we believe that fashion does not need to be physical to exist, and we ask everyone, do you believe? Um, that's all. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Michaela. You know, it takes me back to the time when, uh, as a mom of a teenager, I discovered a very big dent in my credit card bill. And I did wonder where it was. And it pointed me to Fortnite, where my teenage sons were gearing up in multiple skins, uh, multiple identities. Uh, many of them were women clothing, which puzzled me slightly uh, because I didn't have them packed for that site. And they said, no, well, if you're playing, you always look at your back. It's always nicer to look at women's body. So that's why they were buying skins for women. So I have learned a lot on that adventure. Uh, but I haven't seen that migrating to female market yet, although it's very exciting. Uh, so I guess in a discussion, we'll pick up on it. But can I just run a little poll uh, about uh, post your presentation if you manage to uh, switch to our audience's thinking? So. Uh, we have a question to share. Do you think analog fashion will be replaced by digital fashion? So yes, analog fashion is too damaging for the environment and must go. No, people will want to wear trendy clothes in analog worlds or hybrid, expecting more digital fashion and a bit less analog fashion. So if we can uh, submit our answers uh, and then maybe Reza will, will share the results, we see what what people think, because as tempting as it is, it's a long journey from where, where we are now. Uh, but nothing to be said that is impossible, because as we had in Siberia, the, the moment of uh, coming into Siberia being physical and then diving into the screens and become digital, uh, we realized that people have a very, very strong sense of that. And we opened a whole floor in our basement, which was called Sub-Siberia, which was completely handed over to gamers. And they basically lived in the virtual world. And they definitely had their sense of fashion, very, very strong. So Reza, can we share the poll results? Are we, are we able to share? Uh, if not, don't worry, we come back to it. But I think the, the conclusion was that most people prefer a hybrid. Oh yeah, there we go. Yes, yeah, so 59% is looking 
uh, for hybrid. So expecting more digital fashion and a bit less analog fashion. So maybe it will be a transition, but I think you managed to persuade people. So good, good job. <laughs> I hope so. I hope people at least, um, you know, whether they choose to fully participate in the digital fashion world or not, at least um, have some understanding of its possibilities. And, th and that's what we hope to communicate for people that there, there is a new way of thinking about fashion that can hopefully help solve some of these sustainability issues around fashion and just the way that we consume in the world generally. But there's also a law of un unintended consequences, which, which I wanted to pick in the discussion later, because you know, in India, uh, I've been supporting a charity that um, helps uh, girls to come off the streets and train into fashion. And that charity has now helped million girls over the last 15 years. If these girls couldn't go into fashion production, I honestly don't know what they would do because it ain't much to do in India apart from fashion. So, you know, when we throw these questions, I learned with digital that you do one thing as we intended good things with Siberia and then you end up with Cambridge Analytica. So I always try to see, you know, if that, then where else there is a gap. But can we just come back to one more poll following uh, Ingrid's uh, beautiful contribution? So Reza, if you can uh, share the first poll, I just wanted to see how, uh, what are the views on our feet and size body data and how we feel about sharing that. So how do we feel about sharing our feet and size data? I'm okay with that. I don't feel comfortable. I would share my data if it was stored only on my mobile, not on the cloud. So let's have to think about it. What do people think? Because we're all seeking convenience and we all one click generation. But on the other hand, it is our personal, as personal data as it ever comes. Yeah, I had the stats that our partners really haven't got a clue what our size is, but about 100 companies would know exactly. Does it matter? Should we be worried what they do with it? So that's that's for the discussion. Like I can see in my business and also in the project we work with Ingrid on a very beautiful fashion brand, uh, Bluebella, which is now number two uh, fastest growing brand female owned in UK. Uh, there is a lot of gifting going on, but the sizes that men ask for the girlfriend could be absolutely anything, anything. It's like no, no idea. We know, <laughs> but they don't. Uh, okay, should we share the results of the poll? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so people, 45% of are okay with brands having the size of body data. So you're hoping that won't turn into Cambridge Analytica misadventure. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> Okay, so, so moving on to discussion, I think if we accepting our, our body data being shared, or at least you know, half of, nearly half of the people are comfortable with it, uh, I guess the question for, for the discussion is, it's clearly a conflict between our need for convenience and our sense of protection of the body data. So I wanted to ask uh, uh, Michaela, in terms of the digital fashion, what do you see? Do people create these digital avatars that are, you know, taller, slimmer, something, or, or are people looking to create fashion for the real bodies? How, how do you see that? It's interesting. We did a, um, a beta a launch of Leela, a beta test, should I say, of Leela, which happened to land right at the beginning of the first lockdown. So we had a, a very unexpected sequence of events that made everybody quite engaged with what we were doing in a way that we couldn't have predicted. Uh, and part of the iteration um, got people to take a picture of themselves and then it would create a digital avatar, a very almost literal digital depiction of themselves. And then we gave them garments to try on just to see what the feeling was about this. Um, and some of the most interesting feedback that we got was, um, people really weren't that bothered about seeing a literal depiction of themselves. They wanted to, I don't know, maybe see we so different iteration of themselves. Maybe they wanted to be uh, an animal or something mythical or a kind of a, a mermaid. So it's interesting that people kind of, because there are no boundaries in the digital world, they felt this um, quite playful moment where they could be something that they wouldn't otherwise normally be, which we thought was quite fun. Um, but of course, Currently, the, to create your own personal avatar, it's quite labor intensive. I don't know if you've seen these studios that take 
a gazillion pictures at once and they have to take a full 360 view. Until that technology shifts, the personal avatar will be a little bit of a while away, but as we know in the tech world, everything moves incredibly fast. Um, so right now I would say people aren't choosing more uh, flattering versions of themselves, but they're quite interested to see where it will go in terms of more avant-garde or wilder interpretations of the self. Right, that's fascinating because we noticed that with our work with Ingrid on what people order, you know, everybody always thinks they're size less than they are. And so if you show them the real 3D model, which we have done, you know, the, the real, based on real dimensions, people say, no, nah, nah, that's not me, I don't look like that. <laughs> and then, you know, trying to fight through the convenience and delivering the right size with the sense of self-perception is a really long journey and it's not something that anybody wins. But I have to tell you, most brands have now the ability to create 3G, 3D renders of, you know, VIP customers. But people don't do that because the consumer have really rejected that because the idea that your body is floating somewhere in a sort of finished sense, it's not just the dimension, dimension people don't care, but the ones who care and realize it turns into a physical rendered avatar that couldn't be used anywhere for anything. And that's what people didn't like. That, I think that was the points that Ingrid was picking up. That is the, you know, tape measure, it's fine. But when it actually renders your body, ooh, that's not so good. But we had a lot of response that people would like to have it on the mobile, on the device, if it's not shared. But then if it's on the device, it's hard to apply any AI to it. So like, it's very, it's a technical issue. Uh, but I think coming back to uh, our zero, uh, it's very, very important issue with the labor and with the data. What is your thinking about the regulation in the UK? Because, you know, Primark is a UK company and they would swear and they would show you the um, procurement strategy papers and their certifications and they would absolutely swear that they are the most ethical company ever because they have been through tragedy and they have fixed the uh, practices. So to what degree are you following the kind of everyday improvements or, or to what degree is based on perception? No, thank you for that. Um, I will be uh, slightly altering the question, um, but I will not be sending the question back to you, but let, let me rephrase the question. So uh, would that mean that, for example, if we were to take Facebook and the uh, transparency reports that they're often um, publicizing, this would uh, put uh, ourselves at ease uh, when we are um, sharing information online uh, on Facebook? Probably not. So um, it's not one of these cases where the law is lagging behind or the law is not doing enough. But um, being um, um, compliant with the current um, legislative framework is just one part of the picture. Um, because if, if you ask me, that's not enough. Uh, so yes, it might be a mere um, tick um, 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 boxing exercise. But at the end of the day, um, it should not be just up to the um, um, online merchants uh, to, to enforce uh, this, this basis of legislation. Um, as I noted during my short pitch at the, the beginning, at the first part of this event, um, I very much think that the consumer plays a key role in this. Um, so instead of... Um, enforcing um, regulations such as uh, the ones you mentioned about procurement or the ones I mentioned about uh, data protection, such as the GDPR, it would also be nice to um, enable, to empower the consumer so that they themselves have a say in this. Yeah, that's, that's the point I think Ingrid has raised in our previous conversations that Twitter has really changed the power base a little bit because if co consumers don't like the brand as, as Ingrid noted they can be vocal and they can share and they go viral about the critic criticism of the sourcing practices but you're right that the transparency is difficult do you think Ingrid that that Twitter has addressed the balance slightly um, I don't think it's it's 
it's touched on the balance i think definitely i think it's given the consumer much more of a voice um you know in all sorts of transactions whether that's you know being stranded on a flight somewhere you know you can hassle your you know airline on twitter and they will respond more quickly that's actually happened to me before where i was directed to a you know a different place to pick up my ticket and you know go here the, here there and everywhere or you know definitely i think twitter gives the public a voice there's there's no question and i think that you know it's not just twitter i mean interesting what um agura was mentioning about you know the the nudges that we see i think that they are you know in evidence already, um, you know, buying anything online, you often get asked if you want to donate, you know, a fraction of the cost of what you're buying to a charity or to something else. I mean, if you do still shop on Amazon, you can shop on Amazon Smile, where, um, you know, a, a percentage of your money goes to a charity or some other, um, you know, cause that benefits us all as humanity. So I think there is a lot of, to do with empowering and getting consumers more involved exactly as Aguru was saying moving away from this passivity and moving towards consumers seeing the power that they have and being able to exercise that and I think that good brands ethical brands brands that are going to survive are the ones who really respond to that whether that's on Twitter or on their platforms themselves Right, that's yeah, that's a very good point Olga yeah I wanted to come back to you but there is one tra one uh, question from Tracy follows so what do we think about online retail services like Dresscipi, who are looking to create optimized fashion to limit the volume of returns because returns really are quite large at the moment. So she's interested in the fact that we are removing one of the virtues of fashion, which is individuality and self-expression and replacing it with homogeneity because it's more profitable in the short term. So I guess that probably is question to Michaela. Yeah, it's interesting because um, obviously within the, within the ecosystem of what we do, um, there's this whole world of digital try on that's really being accelerated. And I think there's so many different projects to trying to get this, this digital changing room um, out there in the world for exactly this issue to prevent waste and um, avoid this kind of um, the, the returns issue. Um, I think it's really valuable. It's really important. Um, obviously, that kind of pertains to physical fashion, um, and it has more of um, an appropriateness there. Within what we do, I guess it, it's not so much of an issue, but I think it's a really valuable conversation. I think it's incredibly important for physical fashion. But there, but there is a digital waste. You know, I can tell you, my sons are sitting on hundreds of these bloody skins that probably will not be used again. And they have to be stored on some database, which I hope is hydro solar power, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> is, is, is that wasteful? Maybe that's just a collection. Maybe they're just avid collectors. Yeah, well, let's go with that. Yeah, I give them benefit of the doubt. Uh, but it's a very good point. So efficiency versus individuality. I think that's the ultimate conflict that, that we will face. Uh, I also noticed that uh, when you uh, look at people's cupboards, not that I make a habit of it, but I was part of the research during uh, lockdown where the insights were given by people who were at home. And it was very easy to ask them, could you show us what's in your cupboard? Do you know, it was shocking. Everybody's cupboard is worse than mine. I thought I was the worst because I love fashion. Um, th yeah, don't, don't listen, Olga, but I do. Uh, and my cupboard is always bursting, yet I have nothing to wear. And everybody was in the same boat. You know, we were going for, you know, basically over 50 people. You open the cupboard, oh my God, and everything just squashed and pushed. And, you know, what is it with us? Honestly, like it's mental. So we started asking the question, how do you reduce it? Oh, no, I wouldn't. These are my favorite pieces, all of them. <laughs> And people just really, not just the hoarders, but people really love this stuff. They really like mm -hmm. holding on to it and buying new stuff. So I don't really know what the answer to it, but we, we noticed that that is such a prevalent behavior. Mm -hmm. No idea where you start fighting it. But we, we read a lot of stuff by, uh, do you remember uh, Ingrid René Gerard, who is a philosopher, 
uh, followed by Peter Thiel and all the tech bros in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. He uh, talks a lot about mimetics, not as meme, but as in copying behavior, that our innate atavistic behavior is to copy. And it comes from how we learn, how we, cover, how we follow our mom, and then we follow Instagram and I just have to have it. So mm. whatever we see, like it goes straight to the back of our very ancient brain, got to have it, got to have it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting, um, you know, what you say about uh, us, you know, having grown up wanting to hoard and own and enjoy this stuff. But I see those sorts of behaviors really changing, like with my kids, um, you know, they're always on Depop, they're buying, they're selling, they're passing it on. They're much more sort of natural recyclers in a way than I am with my bursting cupboards. You know, I mean, I also do a lot of recycling of clothes and like to get things altered and fitted if I really love them and they don't fit anymore. But I think there's a different sort of sensibility coming through with um, the different generations. And Michaela, I'm sure that a lot of them wouldn't think twice about getting into digital fashion. You know, they've done the skins that are offered by other people. They've customized their trainers, you know, to be ordered. And they're, I think they're ripe to be kind of, you know, creating and buying digital outfits for themselves in whatever platform they choose to uh, express themselves. I think, yeah, absolutely Ingrid. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's absolutely the truth. Whenever we speak to, Gen Z, which is people born after 1997, I believe, and I can't remember, I think it might be Gen Alpha, that's how do you describe people younger than that. Um, we're, we're prepared to begin this conversation explaining what digital fashion is, and they just go, oh yeah, no, that, of course that's the thing. They, they literally do not need it explaining, um, because of course they're digital natives, they, mm -hmm. they've grown up in this world where digital is an expectation. So it's not surprising for them, which is really cheering actually, and absolutely they have this sensibility of swapping and trading and they're, they're very aware of the sustainability conversation in a way that makes me uh, very optimistic for the way things are going i have to say can i can i puncture that a little bit and go back to Algeria? because when you look at the labor law and the labor exploitation you know these avatars don't make themselves the avatars are made quite a lot of them in Philippines in, in big render studios where people don't get paid a lot, but you know, it's better than work in a factory, obviously. So in their view, it's fine. So the labor challenges, which Olga and Algeria work on, they're not going to go away. So people might not be cutting, you know, Primark miniskirts in the dark in some metal shed without aircon in India but they might be doing the rendering in very much the same shed because you know that what do you think about that lawyers do you think olga you will get involved in the chasing the next generation of avatar makers well, we definitely have to because what we cannot do is to substitute one system for the other so we can't uh, now decide that uh, you know uh, bring more digital fashion into our lives without solving the main uh, one of the main uh, issues that this digital fashion is trying to solve which is sustainability you know apart from self-expression um, but um, so and, and I think Peter in the in the chat has uh, pointed at this as well when he said, well, what about all the uh, um, uh, handsets, all the uh, uh, electronics that we need to actually be able to interact? with this technology because we need uh, a new um, handset, we need new uh, software updates, we need, uh, and for new software updates, then we need more uh, complex and, and um, uh, developed machines. So these are still being made and are not being recycled properly. And the e-waste is uh, particularly toxic, as we know, and uh, particularly um, uh, has human rights and environmental challenges as well. Uh, but uh, if you allow me, Eva, I would like to bring back the, the debate a little bit into the data because uh, as part of the, you know, I'm, and I'm passionate about sustainability and human rights, obviously, so could go on talking about this, but I would like to um, uh, ask the speakers about this idea of what, who owns this data and what happens with it, what happens with, the, with whilst we're trying to express our individuality through 
um, this kind of digital uh, fashion and fashion through digital uh, fashion uh, through digital means and consuming through digital means. Um, are we losing a part of our own identity as well? And who um, um, and who should be regulating this? It, should this be a role of the state? And in this, Argiro, I would like to point, you know, to ask you um, how patronizing could it be to be nudge uh, in the name of public policy, for example, or in the name of the, your own preservation of uh, your uh, human rights. So um, yeah, this is that I, I would like to pose this question to to our three speakers and, and um, uh, to my co chair as well. Yeah, that's such a, an interesting um, you know, question. And it is one that, you know, I pointed to in my sort of brief talk. I mean, instinctively, the data belongs to me for my body, I think. I don't think many people would um, sort of disagree with that. But I think, you know, there's a trade off, right, isn't there, between the convenience of getting something that fits and getting it quickly and not having to go back to the post office versus actually having to think through where's it going, who's got it, and all the rest of it, you know, we all just click on cookies, cookies, cookies to get what we want on a website and only rarely take the time to, to see what the fuller policy is. But, you know, I think that it is a, a lot of it is a case of unintended consequences because, you know, talking to friends who work in fashion, who use um, some of these fit companies, I said to one friend, so, you know, what, 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 what did you think you were going to do with the data? What are you planning to do with it? And she said, oh, well, you know, we weren't really thinking or planning to do anything with it, actually. All we were focused on was getting the better customer experience. So, you know, it's at that point that other companies come in who have got bigger, different, maybe slightly more nefarious ideas about what they can do with it. And that's where I think, you know, the regulation and awareness of consumers really needs to come in. You know, I don't think most people are evil and, and want to go out and steal people's body data, but you know, all it takes is one company and a race begins. You're coming back, Ingrid, to the view that technology is neutral. I think we've managed to find out that technology is not neutral. You give people power, they take it. That's what market does. You know, the second you've got some data floating around, somebody will close it, make it closed and use it. You know, we've been part of the Open Data Institute support for a long time. It's a fantastic idea. But all every time they find some good open data, you know, they also find somebody who just takes it, closes it, and sells for a lot of money, not looking too far surveillance data for the geographical data. Uh, but with the uh, with the question of of what the consumer can do about it, it's a lot. And the question to Olga: What would be your your view of application of something which the climate people? are pushing, which is um, citizen assemblies for climate, which are selected by sortition. And we started looking at something like citizens assembly for data selection by sortition, because if you leave the leave it to us, we care, but we are like, you know, four or 5% of the population. Do you think getting people more like a jury service on, on co consumer assemblies for data would be a way forward? That, that is an excellent question, Eva. Um, I I generally think that um, the um, this uh, empowerment, sense of empowerment that as citizen, as as consumers, we've been told we have this kind of consumer power or citizen power through this kind of like more direct democracy is uh, is actually um, a, a farce it is it is superficial this idea that as consumers we are uh, the more uh, information we have about how things are being produced and how things are being uh, marketed to you and how many cookies you have uh, accepted in this case that empowers you and allows you to take better choices is actually um, at, at another marketing tool. And this is happening with the, in the UK, for example, with the UK, with the transparency and supply chain um, regulation is supposed to uh, help you and uh, choose between a company that makes more effort into preventing modern slavery in their supply chain and one that doesn't, but we don't take uh, those uh, choices uh, based on this kind of information, among other things, because, uh, and uh, Eva, you and I had uh, talked about this 
perhaps this um, uh, death by transparency. It's just we're being totally bombarded with uh, information supposedly to make choices. And it comes a moment in which you can't really distinguish what kind of information is the is the right one. So I am except, skeptical as well as, uh, you know, our um, capacity to be empowered as citizens uh, with information that comes at the end of the day is corporate led is the corporations who are or these kind of the big brands that are um, the ones that are releasing or the information or this close in the information so um, i'm sorry i'm not more optimistic about the <laughs> what about <laughs> argyro are you more optimistic about the the power to the people approach oh the power to the people that's very very 90s i have to say um <laughs> and uh we've been disillusioned ever since uh with with everything with all the you know the snowden relations the, the cambridge analytica and uh, the, the next scandal that's just around the corner but um that being said i i do believe that um the consumer is not a passive dot in the middle, uh, so to speak. Uh, yes, of course, there are different um, forces and regulating uh, entities. It's not just the law, by the way. It is the law, the market, social norms. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I do believe that um, the, the driving force, to a certain extent, is uh, with the consumer. Uh, we're just not aware of uh, how much we can we can influence things. And I uh, side with Olga on that one, that it does not really rely on um, informing the consumer. Uh, currently, we, uh, we are actually living a, in a, the, the era where there is abundance of information. Um, but I don't believe that this is going to be the decisive parameter. The decisive parameter is to give a voice to the consumer to enable them to see that they can actually make things happen. And um, that's part of the reason why I uh, firmly believe in data nudges, because unlike educating or informing, uh, this is the step beyond. You're actually allowing the consumer to see that um, there is an alternative scenario rather than you know the repeated cycle, consume, repeat, consume, repeat. Shall we, um, Eva, shall we um, open the uh, floor to our speakers to answer some of the questions in the, in the question and answer? Yeah, so there's a very, very good question from Roger. Could, could these concepts of probably data nudges be applied to grocery to address ethical issues in food supply chain? So I guess that's a zero question. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, well, we did, uh, I think Roger refers to the framework we, we were looking at uh, in terms of the data nudging to improve behavior and to buy more ethical products. So, so he is asking if, if grocery sector should also address ethical issue in full supply chain. Sure, I, I wouldn't see why not. Um, there have been quite a few uh, success stories, um, not so much in the uh, in terms of uh, the, the food sector, uh, but take for example green nudges uh, to aid uh, environmental free um, um, policies. Um, so one way is to to influence behavior. Um, um, towards um, um, more greener um, uh, choices. Um, and we've seen in the past um, even some um, gamified um, experiences and um, smart incentives uh, so as to aid, uh, to, to enhance, to promote these type of goals. Um, take, for example, the, um, I think, yeah, Universidad de Costa in, in Colombia, uh, where the, uh, the students and staff, they received small gifts, um, provided that they would uh, exchange uh, recyclable material. So I wouldn't see why this should not be um, applied in the food sector as well. Great. Can I, I bring a question as well now uh, from Benjamin Greenway? And I think this is uh, probably addressed to Michaela. This is um, when you make physical, physical fashion, a physical fashion item, you make it once. The question is, uh, how do you address the rendering material problem of digital fashion? Do you have 
to me, uh, make versions for each uh, of each item for every virtual platform, or um, what are going to be the fashion compatible uh, platforms? Yeah, it's an interesting question that everyone is trying to solve in the digital fashion space right now. So you make one render um, and the utility and um, the way that the garment can be used is coded into the garment. Um, so depending on the platform, um, for example, there's a platform called Sansa, which is a digital event space where you can try on a garment and go to a music event, a digital music event, of course, dressed uh, however you want to uh, be dressed for this event. Um, and then you could maybe move it to um, a marketplace. You might decide that you've purchased a digital garment and then you want to sell it. Um, and then you might want to move it into a gaming environment, for example, and, and sort of rove around in the gaming environment. So this question of interoperability is, um, is a big question right now, because obviously each of these environments operates independently with their own ecosystem that they're quite protective of. Actually, the three that I've just described I, came to mind because we created a, a garment for Atari that had exactly that utility. You could move from a very specific game, not every game, an Atari game into a digital marketplace and wear it at an, an event in Sansa. Um, so I know those parts of the ecosystem are possible right now. Then could you transition your garment to a very popular global platform like Fortnite and start wearing it in there as a skin? Not right now, because obviously Fortnite is a huge marketplace, as Eva well knows, for um, young people buying skins that they want. Yes, all, all from my money. <laughs> <laughs> You've made them very rich, Eva. Well done. <laughs> Um, so yes, this is a question. So, so it's not the render itself. You don't have to create multiple renders, but it's the way that you code the garment it has to be specific to the platform to allow this um, movement around the digital ecosystem. Um, the big thing that we're moving towards, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with this concept, so I'll throw it out there, is the metaverse. The metaverse is a persistent virtual world in which our digital selves will exist. So at some point in the not too distant future, we'll have a digital twin which will buy things in the metaverse, have meetings in the metaverse and, and, and have transactions in the metaverse. That requires this interoperability to be able to move from different environments um, and trust that there's lots of um, much smarter people than me that know how all this techie stuff that are um, trying to solve this right now. But um, yeah, it's a good question. So the, the interoperability is somewhat limited right now, but it's kind of... Um, it's a work in progress, shall we say. Right. There's a very good question about the sustainability choices and the nudges. That's all very well, but if the sustainable product is more expensive, as it tends to be, how consumer will be convinced in the future? So I guess that's our zero question. So I'm, I'm reading that from, from the chat. Yeah, if the sustainable product is more expensive, can you still nudge for people to buy it, do the right thing when the wallet says uh, it's a bit pricey? I see, right. So, um, well, nudges come in all sizes. Um, they can be um, of financial nature, but otherwise, what is uh, currently this, this, this scenario being described is actually the opposite of a nudge. So if you're trying to achieve um, a policy whereby uh, you would go for the most sustainable product, then you need to have some sort of economic incentives that, that would um, really um, signify a good nudge in that sense. So you would effectively lower the prices. Um, however, if this is not feasible, then again, in terms of data nudges, what could be done is to monitor um, the purchasing habits, behavioral patterns there, but not so as to target uh, the, the um, consumers later on, uh, as it currently is the case, but rather to group them in different categories and then to be able and um, guide them in the right choice, uh, but in a more personalized manner. Um, this has been the case with, uh, with uh, similar um, data-based nudges uh, in um, mass transport. Um, so to give you an example, um, fairly recently, um, there has been a, a large-scale project in uh, Toronto and Vancouver where um, probably 
four out the five people take their cars and what they tried to do, uh, and by they is the um, uh, metro uh, transit network, was to monitor carefully the people that they would choose public transport and then group them in different categories. So frequent, less frequent, and so on and so forth. And then to target them in groups so as to be able to get the message across that would be a successful nudge. Now, um, if you add to this scenario the parameter of, let's say, uh, the ticket uh, getting more expensive, then uh, I'm guessing that this just uh, makes things a bit more difficult. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, this would not be part of um, um, a data-driven nudge. Very, very right. good point. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you, uh, Argir, and thank you all. I think uh, we're running now out of time. Uh, we're at this fascinating. We're at such an interesting conversation from, and so many different angles. Um, so I think, um, Eva, maybe we can just give the floor to the speakers uh, one last time for to close uh, for one uh, one uh, minute to close and uh, to tell us what. What will be your closing remarks? And if you, you know, think about these data issues in this multiple transfers of data skins, as Ghislaine has put it brilliantly. Uh, sorry, uh, Michaela, if you want to go first and then Ingrid and finally Argiro. Yeah, it's so um, insightful for me to hear this conversation because everything that we do in the digital fashion world is brand new. So we're sort of building the plane as we fly in it. Um, and we're working out this stuff in the moment. So it's great to know all of these questions that people have and concerns because we're able to, it, given that we're iterating right now for these platforms and it's happening right now as we speak, it's great to be able to feed those learnings in and, and try and make it work in a way that, um, you know, takes care of people's data and, and is very conscious of enabling people in parts of the world that maybe don't have the infrastructure that we have and, and it not becoming one of these unintended consequences. Um, I don't have any kind of fully realized answer because um, we're only able to learn about what we do as we iterate. So we have to put things out in the world um, and then learn from it. Um, but it's great to know that these insights are what the, the concerns are what pe at the forefront of people's minds as we move forward into our kind of digital fashion future. Thanks, Michaela. Yeah, I can't wait to see this digital fashion future if I ever get there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the event. Great comments and perspectives and insights all round. I suppose for me, my sort of big takeaway, apart from the exciting fashion future, is just being aware, going in with eyes open with data. We've seen the sort of havoc it can wreak and the way that it can change the world that we live in. We just have to be ever vigilant about how it gets used and how we regulate it and how we understand it. And I'm, I'm sure that there'll be, you know, technology coming forward that will allow us to do that. I think Tim Berners-Lee is already working on, you know, your sort of, um, you know, not your, yeah, your data self that goes out rather than your individual self, as it were. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it's just watch this space, but sort of watch your back as well. <laughs> Um, I, I must say, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, today's event and it gave me a lot of food for thought. And thanks so much for the questions as well. Uh, they were not easy ones, I have to say. Um, now, the, the final remarks. So uh, while we were all discussing, um, this came to mind um, back in mid-90s, if I remember correctly, in one of the first um, hackers convention uh, across the pond, um, someone famously said, data wants to be free. <laughs> now, several decades down the line, um, I have to say that data wants nothing. <laughs> I do agree with Ingrid, data is neutral. Um, and uh, we've seen data being owned, uh, we've seen data being regulated, uh, we've seen data being hacked. Um, but at the end of the day, what really matters is that data is a valuable tool. Um, and um, 
I would like to finish just by saying that it would be nice for once to see data being utilized as a great tool put to an excellent public um, um, interest rights-based cause, and that would be uh, sustainable futures. That's wonderful. Excellent way to, to conclude. Um, and, um, our curator is coming in to, to say uh, goodbye now. So um, thank you from um, Eva and myself to all the speakers. And uh, Ghislaine, uh, you got the floor now. You're mute, Elaine. You're mute. You're mute. <laughs> Thank you. So stay with me, stay with me, because that was a wonderful talk, a really great debate. And as we started out in this whole series, we knew that we were going to be talking futures and what's out there onwards, not necessarily the answers. And this debate really took us looking at some very, very, very futuristic um, outlines and options. So thanks to you all. And um, thank you very much also to everyone who's attended and the wonderful chat box that's been going on. It's massively wonderful, really great stuff. And now's your last chance to add in any other links that you think might be interesting. As we mentioned, we'll be making this chat box, in, box into a resource document, and that will be posted up under the recordings of these webinars on the University of Greenwich Research Space YouTube site, which I think um, Bree's just going to pop up. Yep, there's the link up to the YouTube website, website for University of Greenwich Research. So do keep looking there over the next few weeks. By within four weeks, we'll have them all up there. And there'll be a whole series with a whole series of PDFs for use for, for, for lectures, for for sharing knowledge for um, anyone, anywhere. And that's not just for Greenwich University, of course. That is to share with all out there in a knowledge exchange between academics, researchers, enterprise, creative industries, and everyone else is interested, including all of the artistic um, people who are involved in this too, and the creatives. So, so um, just to say also, there is another webinar in this series, which starts in 30 minutes. And I think Karen's going to put the link up so that if any of you do want to join us in 30 minutes, the next one is looking at gaming for good and sustainable consumption and production in a data-driven world. So based in the same themes, looking at this invisible data around the body um, and the, the links going up now, yep, you can join the next webinar in half an hour with us, have a cup of tea, rush to the loo, run up and downstairs and get some energy and come and join us. So that'd be really great. So, and the final webinar in this present series of Nudge Push 21 is called Sustainable and Ethical Usage of Body Data in Immersion Environments. And this is looking at XR, VR, AR, um, use in the arts and creative industry, in corporate, etc and actually does relate quite strongly to some of the endpoints that have come into this debate, which is really positive. Um, so the whole issue of body data and our body data and our data cells and actually how at the moment that is really quite fragmented out there in multiple places in the world and much of it doesn't belong to us and that debate about whether that matters or not that Eva put up in the poll even that came through, um, the data self and, the, and the, the physical self and how we actually start to relate those. And Michaela, you mentioned metaverses and we will be speaking about metaverses there and blockchain and NFTs. Um, so the back end of these digital objects in the digital fashion scene. We are also going to have an expert in VR and the actual pickup of uh, biometrics there, which can rapidly identify you within, you know, with gait and face, face re facial recognition within two to five minutes, we can all be recognized. Um, plus an expert on implants and embedded subdermal um, transmission of data from within the body out and in. And also we're gonna have a really good scan and scope across the different data mutualization, mutualization options that are coming into the marketplace. And many different people are trying to find solutions for this data unions, data mutuals, etc. Who knows what's going to be the final answer? Here we are looking to the future again and onwards in our research. So do sign up for that. I believe that's also the registrations being put up in the chat room now, the Eventbrite link. So it just leaves me now to say thank you very much to the chairs of this event, Olga Martin, Martin Ortega and Eva Pasco. Absolutely excellent. I've really enjoyed preparing with you. We've had a great time and I think there's a lot more to go on from here. And to the amazing input from the speakers, Ingrid Caricari, Arguro Car Caranacio and Michaela Larus. 
really thank you for sharing your knowledge and your thoughts and again your future kind of profiting pro um, profit pro profiting it's not profiting future foresight on all of this area so um and thanks very much also to the university of greenwich who are hosting these webinars and the amazing events team there Faka raza who is doing all of the um, technical direction i believe he's based he's actually in the czech republic he's not even in in uk at the moment karen ward who's director on the event side in london Jaylan Akbas, who works with Olga and Arguro, but who's been working here, putting loads into the chat box and supporting us. And Bree Pal, who works with me, Body Data Space, been doing masses into the chat box too. And also a special thank to, thanks to Susanna Lowell, who's the, our, our, our super tweeter, who's just been tweeting away really great stuff on this, on the hash nudge push 21. So maybe my last request is that anyone who does do Twitter, do have a look at hash nudge push 21 after here. Have a look at those and do retweet this and retweet other stuff about the events coming up. So we look forward to working with you all again. Thank you very much indeed. And look out for the recordings. Um, thanks very much for generous input. Thank you.